So uh, my name is Nuan Das, and I'm a technical lead uh, working for WSO2. Uh, so today I'll be walking you through a session uh, in which I hope to cover basic aspects of uh, securing, monitoring, and monetizing your APIs. So to uh, start off with, well, let's quickly brief through what we actually mean on managing an API. So I'm sure you must have heard this uh, several times. Uh, <clears throat> so managing an API is about advertising it in the first place. So you make it discoverable on an API portal. And then comes the part of actually controlling your API subscriptions. Like you want to control who gets access to your APIs in which way and what kind of governance you want to do on those aspects. And then comes the part of uh, SLS, making your API available over service level agreements. And after that, it then comes the part of actually securing your API. Uh, and monetizing, monitoring and monetizing aspects of it. So during this presentation today, we are going to cover the securing, monitoring and monetization parts of uh, API management. Uh, so quickly to dive into the API security aspects of it. So if you think of APIs, APIs are actually being consumed by applications, never directly by any end users or anything like that. So these applications can vary. They are uh, different types of applications that are being used out there in the world. Uh, they could be mobile applications, they could be web applications, browser-based, JavaScript kind of applications, likewise. So if you come to think of it, what you're actually doing by accessing an API is you're granting your rights to a particular application to access a resource on your behalf. So essentially what you're doing is you're delegating your rights to, th to this particular application to do something on your behalf. So this is called identity delegation. So API security, at the core of API security, where it lies is identity delegation. And that is what, in, what is being explored uh, over this protocol or specification of OAuth 2. So OAuth 2 has now built, up, built itself up to be like the de facto standard for API security. It's built up a wide range of popularity and gaining uh, quite a lot of popularity in the API security world as well. It's predeceasing from the OAuth 1.0 and OAuth wrap specifications. And this uh, particular specification operates on a thing called an access token, which I'm sure you must have heard of. So it's like a key that gives you access to a particular resource, the access token. And this particular specification also talks about grant types and token types. So we'll be looking at those as we move along the presentation. And some commonly used terminology when we talk about OAuth 2 are uh, user, uh, which represents the actual resource owner, the user who's using the application, and the client, which actually represents the client application, uh, the resource server, the place where you host all your resources, and the authorization server, which does all the security uh, stuff of your APIs. So these are kind of like the common uh, terminology used in this world of OAuth 2. And this particular diagram illustrates how an access token is used in a, a, when your client application is ac actually uh, accessing the resources. So your client application would be sending this particular token uh, as part of a header or as part of a URL onto the resource server. In this case, the resource server is the WSO2 gateway, API gateway component of the API manager. And the gateway communicates with the authorization server, which is the key managed part of it, to do the validation of this token and to do the validation of its scopes, etc. So once the validation is granted by the authorization server, then comes the part of uh, the resource server deciding whether to grant access to this resource or not, which could, rely, which could lie in your backend uh, application servers. So this is basically how an access token is used in the world of OAuth 2. And then we uh, dive a little bit into these different types of grants. So like I uh, mentioned before, uh, there are different types of applications out there in the world. And each of these different kind of applications have their own authentication and authorization mechanisms. And there are certain restrictions in each of these kinds of applications. Uh, meaning that there could be some applications which you could trust to, uh, to get the user's credentials and do some work with it. And some which you cannot really trust trust to get the user's credentials. And there could be applications like JavaScript applications that run on the client side. So there are certain restrictions uh, 
when it comes to these types of applications consuming your APIs. And so the OAuth specification actually defines different types of grants for handling each of these different types of use cases. For example, the authorization code, implicit uh, resource owner password credentials and client credentials are like the most, the four most popular grants being used uh, within the specification. And it also uh, defines some other popular grants, such as the JWT bearer grant and the SAML bearer assertion. So for applications that are like using SSO for login, they wouldn't really be having an, a, a, a user credential with themselves, but they would be having is a SAML assertion. So the SAML assertion uh, spec defines how you can exchange your SAML access token, SAML token in exchange for an access token. So similarly, the resource owner password credentials grant type uh, describes how you can use your, the user's credentials along with the application's credentials to get an access token in exchange. And then the authorization code and implicit, they are two different graphs that work based on browser redirects and uh, um, intermediary authorization code, etc. So there are different kinds of grants and the WSO2 API management and identity solution uh, components or products, they support almost all these grant types listed down here and some other grant types as well. And more interestingly, it also supports the ability to define your own grant types. So as an enterprise, you may be having uh, use cases where you validate or where you authenticate users based on your propriety or uh, your, de your self-defined protocols. So if you want the API management solution to be able to consume or use those protocols instead of the ones that are defined in the spec, you could do that by defining your own grant type. And the API management solution and also the identity manager, uh, identity server supports or uh, provides this ability of defining your own grants. And then we go into a little bit of uh, fine-grained authorization. So uh, the spec defines a way how you can access, uh, protect your sub-resources using uh, scopes. So a scope in the API, WSO2 API manager's context can be bound to a particular role. So that is what is illustrated in this image here. And once you have defined your scope, what you can do is you can protect your resources with, with the particular scopes that you define. So essentially what happens behind the scenes when you do this is uh, you're, you can protect your resources by user roles. So only a certain a uh, group of people having a certain permission will be able to access these resources. So this is the specification coming, uh, this is the uh, feature coming from the specification that allows you to do fine-grained authorization control. And then the, if you want to go into finer grain detail, like Isabel mentioned in her presentation, like if you want to grant access to a particular resource, like for say during a certain period of time, of the day or a certain period of time of the week. So to support those kinds of scenarios, uh, you can use the WSO2's, uh, the WSO2 identity server's capabilities to do that. So it supports, it can act as a SACML engine and you could define your policies uh, as a SACML policy and deploy it on the WSO2 identity server. The identity server would act as a policy decision point in this case. So when it is used in conjunction with the API manager, the API manager will act as a policy enforcer. So it will do a communication with the identity server to check whether this user has fine-grained access control and decide to allow, uh, decide, take a decision on whether to allow the request to pass through or not. So this is basically the pattern that you would need to follow if you are going for finer-grained detail of access control for your APIs. Uh, then comes an interesting capability of doing identity federation which I'm sure you must have heard of if you had attended any of the identity uh, tracks or uh, talks. So the WSO2 identity server has a capability of acting as an identity bus of brokering identity between different IDPs. So if you're an organization which already has an IDP in place, which does authentication and authorization, and you want to integrate this particular solution with the API management solution that you want to bring on top of it, you can do that by leveraging the capabilities of the WSO2 identity server. So it can act as an uh, identity bus to do that. For example, it has out-of-the-box support for uh, authenticating with Facebook, Google, Yahoo, Microsoft, etc., and any other IDP that operates on standard protocols such as SAML, OpenID, uh, OAuth, 
likewise. So the identity server can be used in these kinds of cases where you want it to, where if you want to manage, uh, if you want to onboard an API management solution with an existing identity provider. When this comes handy is like, it, we know that it takes some kind of trouble when you want to introduce a totally new identity provider into your organization. So it's best if you can uh, like use the existing IDP to get your uh, authorization done in con conjunction with the API management solution. And another interesting feature that's coming up in the next immediate release of the API manager is its ability to integrate an interface with an existing OAuth server. So if you're an organization, an enterprise that does APIs already, and you already have an OAuth server in place, the WSO2 API manager can interface with this for uh, application registration, for access token generation, and for access token validation as well. So if you already have a system that does uh, these capabilities, and you want to leave it as it is and integrate it with the WSO2 API management solution, you could do that uh, by using the capabilities of integrating uh, it with the OAuth server. So this di sequence diagram kind of like illustrates uh, two scenarios where how, how you could, you could uh, generate a request and how the gateway can talk with the external OAuth server to validate it. And then comes a part of JWT. So JWT is a means of presenting user claims to a backend system. So if, in your, if you want to present the user's uh, permissions, different kinds of claims, and application metadata to your backend systems, you could do that by using the JWT capabilities available in the platform. So uh, JWT contains different kinds of information like uh, user claims, roles, application details, likewise. So uh, that information could be presented to your backend through the JWT. A sample JWT is illustrated in here. It has like three parts, the header, payload, and the signature. So in, a, in an ideal scenario, the JWT would be signed by the API management solution. It would, the signature would be validated by your uh, backend system. So this book, authored by our director of security, Prabhat Sirivadana, is quite a nice book which illustrates a lot of scenarios on advanced API security. So I would recommend that you go through it if you want to find out more, if you are more interested in finding out more information on API security stuff. Then let's go into the part of monitoring. So monitoring actually consists of two parts. One is operational monitoring and business monitoring. So operational monitoring and business monitoring both have their benefits and advantages. Let's uh, dig into each one of those. So operational insights, why they are important is now, as we know, production systems are not a single standalone VM, right? In many cases, they are complex deployments consist consisting of different several nodes for high availability, for failover scenarios. So it's important as a DevOps guy that you get a picture of your entire deployment in a single snapshot instead of having to go into each of the uh, different uh, servers and having to monitor them. So having a strong operational uh, monitoring platform becomes pretty important for you when you want to monitor the health of your entire uh, deployment. And uh, as you know, operational conditions may change from time to time. So this can be based to, this can be due to like network resources being clogged, your database growth, uh, concurrency reasons, likewise. So you need to find out the reasons behind uh, the changes that are ha happening in your system. So uh, having a, strong operational, operational monitoring capability is pretty important. And then to address performance implications, to find out why uh, you are encountering performance implications. So, and then to avoid applying the wrong fix. So in many cases, we apply fixes based on assumptions, uh, based on guesses. But if you have a strong operational monitoring platform capability available in your system, you can actually narrow down the issue to, actual, to the actual location where the issue is, and that will help you to figure out the issue and the uh, root cause of it pretty easily. So what the platform has to offer in terms of these aspects is that the WSO2 platform has a very strong analytics uh, product suite, which consists of the data analytics server, which was called BAM uh, earlier, and the complex event processor, and we also have a new product coming up called the uh, machine learner, so these, the combination of these three components offer you, offers you a very pretty strong uh, operational and business monitoring capabilities. 
So wh what the other tools in the platform offers is that they have the capabilities of tracing an event through its entire life cycle. So in this case, when a message is received on the gateway, it goes through this life cycle until it reaches the response end. And on each of these events, it publishes a request to the analytics layer. So, and it also generates a correlation ID that can be used to track your messages throughout the entire system. So by using the data available in your analytics layer, you can really find out what happened to a message that went through, uh, where it fell off likewise. And the WSO2 complex event processor is yet again another interesting piece of software uh, that, is, that can be used for identifying access patterns. Like for example, you want to, th there's a particular subscriber who's uh, hitting your throttling limits at a consistent level. So you can use the CEP to identify that, to detect that, and ask him, or like give him the options of upgrading to a new tier, likewise. And especially if you're in the financial services industry for threat detection and for triggering alerts and notifications kind of things, for performance monitoring, monitoring of your CPU memory usage, and of course for monitoring the health through uh, res response times likewise. And then we uh, dive into the business monitoring aspects of it. So uh, an API ecosystem has several parties who form a kind of a, like a chain in such a way that they nourish each other by their uh, by the stuff they do. So your organization could have a set of service providers and API creators which, who actually expose your data and services to the outside world. And the application developers actually, they consume these uh, APIs for developing applications that consume these APIs. And the end users, the users of these applications, they buy these applications from the app developers and they use it. Uh, and at the end of the day, they generate some revenue back again to the organization which exposed the APIs. So they form this ecosystem. And the, the players in this ecosystem, each one of these players have their own set of goals and needs. So for example, the business owners, they could have goals of increasing sales, retaining existing customers, likewise. So they would be interested in getting information uh, related to like commonly moving items, uh, customer trends, uh, possible store locations, likewise. So similarly, each one of the, the category of these, uh, these parties, they are interested in a, achieving a set of goals and for the sake of that, deriving some information. So the WSO2 uh, data analytics server is a component that allows you to get that information out of the system. So it works uh, based on a set of event receivers, which is capable of receiving events through various channels. And it has a analytics layer in the middle, which can clearly analyze the aspects in different verticals so that they can be exposed to the interested parties uh, as, uh, as they make sense. And then it also has a separate dashboarding layer uh, which can be used for visualizing the data that you get out of this analytics layer. So this component allows you to do, or product rather, allows you to uh, categorize this information as and how you like, like it. So these are some stats that are offered by default uh, in the default offering of the API management and uh, data analytics or BAM serve. So some general API usage re reports and application usage reports uh, likewise. And then the API management platform is also capable of integrating with Google Analytics. So with the integration of Google Analytics, you get another rich set of data which can be used by these interested parties for making business decisions. So one example is you can find out the geographical locations of your uh, end users. And also you can find out the types of devices that your users use. What are the most used type of devices, likewise. So this information can be uh, interested uh, to different people. So for example, business owners might be interested in knowing in which region their user base is growing. So if they have an idea of opening up a new store or something like that, you can, they can take decisions based on that. And app developers can also find out which type of uh, platform are there is being heavily used. Is it like on the Android platform? Is it the desktop applications likewise? So they can focus their efforts based on that information they receive to uh, like uh, up their game on the applications. Then we come into the part of API monetization. So API monetization is a tricky but a yet very interesting capability, 
right? So now you may have realized that the relevance of APIs today are going beyond the IT department perimeter. The reason for that is APIs are used to integrate systems that span across business units now. And not only across business units, but across entire enterprises as well, right? And the consumer demand for seamless experience is driving this need for unprecedented in integration. Integration that we never even thought about would be possible or never even thought about that would be needed. So these monetization aspects actually drive this need. So that something that has been found out is that only very few uh, direct monetization strategies have, uh, have found, proven to be working. So one example is Amazon. So Amazon has a set of APIs uh, that they use to integrate into their retail, uh, retailers' inventories to sell items. So the business strategy that Amazon uses is that they don't charge uh, <coughs> those retailers for every API call. Instead, they only charge them for the items that are sold to the end users. So that's the, uh, like the, at a high level business model of Amazon. So that is a like, rare and a successful example of a scenario where the core business APIs are generating some revenue for the companies. In most of the cases, that's not the scenario. Like, especially enterprises in the financial services, government, telecommunications, industries, uh, they have like, thought of doing APIs, but found out soon that consumers are not interested in paying for these services. So their wealth actually lies not in the APIs. They are not enterprises who sell APIs. Their wealth lies in their data. That's their value. So let me take a small example. Like when I travel overseas, and if I use my credit card uh, <coughs> in a foreign country, uh, within a few minutes or sometimes few hours of making the transaction, I get a call from my bank asking me whether I'm traveling uh, to find out whether this is a legitimate transaction. So I, I tell them yes, and then they ask me like when I'm returning back. So they make a note on their system saying that from this period to this period, this user is in this particular country. But if you think of it, by the time they called me and got to know this information, the transaction had already been done. I mean, even if it was a fraudulent transaction, it would have been committed, right? So now, if you think of this scenario, my mobile service provider is, a, uh, is an entity which already has my location information. And also the immigration department of Sri Lanka, uh, the Sri Lankan government also has my uh, like travel details. So if this mobile service provider or the immigration department had an API that exposed this information to the bank, the bank could have actually uh, called this particular API to, to check whether I'm a user who was actually traveling and even prevent that uh, transaction from happening if it, is, it would, if it was not a legitimate case. So as you can see, my location information was not the core business of my telecommunications uh, service provider, but it's kind of like a byproduct in some cases. So if they had an API which exposed this information, I'm sure the bank would have paid to use that particular service out of the telecommunications provider, right? So, uh, so this example illustrates how your like, non-core business data can generate a lot of value for you, right? So deciding or coming up with this particular monetization strategy depends on the type of business that you do, depends on what you sell, what information you have. So coming up with that strategy is up to the business. But when you want to do that, and uh, when you figure out uh, what you want to do, you, you need to have a strong platform in place to expose this data out as clear APIs. And the WSO2 platform offers you just that. And how it does that is, and now it has a separate a suite of products doing data analytics, which consists of the data analytics server, the complex event processor, and the machine learner. So they can be used as components to drive data into your organization through different channels, through the various applications or services. And they can be formatted in such a way that it makes sense to expose your API to generate some revenue out of it. And once you have all your data in place nicely in a formatted way, you can use the integration layer of the platform to expose this data as APIs. So the integration components available in the platform like the data services server, the enterprise service bus, and possibly the message broker can be used in conjunction to get all this data and expose them as nice clean APIs. And then the API management platform of the uh, WSO2 product stack 
can be used to expose these APIs in a nicely managed and a formatted way. So this platform helps you in, uh, in such a way that it can unleash the power of your data that you have in such a way that it can generate a lot of revenue. So with that, uh, I come to the conclusion of my presentation. Music